Welcome to this special Q&A for the film Becoming Cousteau, directed by Liz Garbus. Very pleased to have Liz Garbus with us today. Uh, her last time at the festival was with her film Love, Marilyn. Welcome back, Liz. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you've made documentaries about Marilyn Monroe and Nina Simone and Bobby Fischer and, lo and lots of other figures. What was it that drew you to Jacques Cousteau or, or got you involved in this project? Uh, you know, I grew up watching his TV show, um, as many of us did in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And um, we and I, you know, had dreams of being aboard the Calypso with Jacques and his crew. I mean, it was just it was transporting. And um, a few years ago, maybe five years ago, when I was reading a book to my son about the undersea world, I realized that he had no idea who Jacques Cousteau was. Yet his entire media diet or a good part of it was, you know, was uh, drowning <laughs> in undersea imagery from Shark Week to, you know, beautiful Blue Planet, you know, all of these incredible shows, which essentially Jacques Cousteau made possible with his pioneering, um, you know, Aqualong scuba um, gear and of course his underwater um, filmmaking technology that, that he invented along with his um, partners. So it felt like um, there was this kind of giant that was being lost to um, a generation. And I love making films. Um, and I think Bobby Fischer was very much one of those too, about folks who you kind of think you know, but in fact, you just have the tip of the iceberg. And there was this incredible journey that Cousteau went on, um, sort of a buildings Roman type of journey where, you know, he sort of starts out as this um, adventurer, explorer, almost conqueror type um, personality of the oceans, just wanting to go deeper, further, and pushing and pushing, and he loses crew members, you know, friends along the way, and blows up sea life in order to to test things. And as he's having this, um, you know, kind of continuing to penetrate and go deeper, he starts to realize that the ocean is changing before his very eyes. And that journey um, was one I didn't think was well understood. I certainly didn't understand it as just a fan of his show. Um, and it was just very rich um, material for storytelling. So, I mean, since I've watched the film, I've been kind of poking around to <clears throat> understand what other biographical material there is out there about Jacques Cousteau. And there wasn't as much as I thought that there would be for a, a figure who is so you was such a ubiquitous presence in uh, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, the, I, I saw a biography, but, you know, it felt in the reviews I read of that biography, uh, it felt like you know, that author wasn't able to, uh, you know, to, to uh, get everyone to talk about um, uh, Cousteau. So I wonder, as you embarked on this, you know, what was the kind of, you know, biographical body of work that you were able to tap into? And what were the areas that you needed to, you know, to probe deeper? Well, you're you're right, and I think that's exactly you know why I wanted to make this film because there really wasn't much out there. And you know, in the 20th century, as you mentioned, you know, at some point he was the most recognizable face on the planet. You know, I mean, he was this huge superstar. I mean, it's hard to comprehend. Um, but um, yes, there had been very little, and I, and part of that was um, the protectiveness that um, those who were looking after his estate felt, um, and their skepticism <laughs> of um, suitors. Um, you know, they had this incredible archive, and you know, they had you know this beautifully um, you know protected and uh, you know thirty five millimeter prints that had never been seen before, and home movies and um, and it was just a a big undertaking to work with them to get them to to share. But ultimately, they did. They decided to trust us, and I'm grateful for that. But it was not easy, and it took many years for that um, arrangement to be struck. So um, I think that is a reason that there haven't been um, films about him before. That it, that it was really kind of a marathon to to get there. Um, and also Jeek, which is how he was called by his friends, Jeek was very private. I mean, we include a, a clip from an interview in the film where, he, you know, an interviewer is asking him about his like, you know, internal demons and how they might have spurred his uh, his quest for um, adventure and uh, and exploration. And he, you know, he refuses this question. You know, he says, I'm not interested in myself. So I think there was a there was 
he was he was despite being one of the most exposed men on earth he was very very closed um so yes it was my job to try to scratch that surface and to um you know introduce him hopefully to another generation who understands whose shoulders um uh, you know, all the beautiful undersea filmmaking we have now is our, who, whose shoulders they are standing on. Well, I'd love to hear more about how you, you know, made decisions about, you know, what areas of his life to go into, um, you know, especially considering th that he did seem protective and, and you know, he himself uh, rebuffed uh, certain inquiries. There's, you know, all kinds of versions of Jacques Cousteau. There's, you know, the explorer, there's the environmentalist, and then there's the, you know, the human being, the father, husband, um, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you know, can you talk about how you made your choices about, you know, the, the rounded portrait that you created? You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, there, you know, there should be more films about Jeek. I mean, he had a big, big, big life. Um, and, um, and yes, you could certainly, um, go in any one of those directions and have a very satisfying feature doc. I mean, I was really interested in this transformation from adventurer to conservationist. I felt it had a message for our time and this moment in which we're confronting, um, you know, the most dire warnings about our planet that we've heard now on the front pages of newspapers, which of course, Jeek was talking about in 1992, 40 years ago, um, but, um, oh no, 30 years ago, excuse me, bad math. Um, you know, we had dire warnings about our planet, which Sheik was warning about 30 years ago. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to focus on how somebody becomes an activist in some ways, um, because really the last uh, era of his life was focused on activism for conservation. Um, and I wanted also to um, reignite the love for the undersea world that he had um, with his band of um, merry explorers on the Calypso. Um, so, so for me, that that was the goal to um, evoke that love for the ocean that he brought to us, as well as focus on the education of an environmentalist. Um, but I could not ignore the fact that as a man, he had a had a had a um, complex family life. I think those informed him. The loss of his son, I think made him an even more dedicated environmentalist than he may have been without going through that personal loss. Um, and I think the birth of his two children from his second wife um, also gave him the desire to keep going after that loss. So those parts of his personal life really informed that buildings Ramon that I, that I alluded to. Um, I want to ask you about Cousteau as a filmmaker, because I think one of the things that you're, film does, especially in the sections with Louis Maul, uh, is, you know, remind us that um, that he was a filmmaker. And I, his film, The Silent Worlds, that won the Oscar and the Palme d'Or, is not a film that people watch a lot of uh, these days. Um, and and his TV show, you know, the, all of those, those of us who grew up watching it, um, is, you know, is not as present as it is in, you know, in the lives of our children. Um, so I wonder as a filmmaker yourself, what you responded to in, uh, in, in his technique and artistry as a filmmaker. You know, he was funny. I mean, he, you know, and we, we very uh, decidedly included this, 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 this reference in the film, but he says, you know, my films are not documentaries. That sounds like a lecture uh, in a, in a, in a classroom. They are adventure films. Right. And he rejected that word documentary, which um, I thought was hilarious. Um, but I think that, I mean, that's exactly why I, we needed to make this film, right? You know, we, you know, Octopus Teacher winning the Oscar last year. Um, so, and the technology has improved so much that, um, you know, his films have gone into obscurity, right? Like people are used to seeing so much more with so much more resolution. And um, there's such exquisite filmmaking going on under the, the sea. Um, but I think that in order, it's like sort of not understanding you know, who was, you know, Vertov when you're talking about, I mean, I think in order to understand um, where we are now, we need to understand where we came from. And he presents that kind of um, touch point for all of us. Um, and in terms of his filmmaking, I mean, I wanted to linger in the beauty of the undersea world, but I also really wanted to tell a story that I thought 
was relatable and hopefully um, gripping. And I know that for him was always key. Um, I'd love to hear you talk more about the restoration of this footage. When uh, I saw an early cut of the film, it was uh, before you had re replaced the, you know, the, the old archival footage with the restored footage. And it was really a transformation to, uh, to watch, you know, what a print looks like when you just pull it direct out of the archive and, and then after you go through a process of restoration. Um, so, I mean, can you talk about your own engagement uh, with, with that footage? Yes. Well, I mean, as we record this, um, probably a month before the festival, we are still <laughs> cleaning up these um, these prints. I mean, we, you know, the the the, um, the Cousteau archive is, of course, the crown jewel for the Cousteau Society. So we had two places in Paris that we were allowed to work on the film prints. Um, so we have been back and forth a bit. Um, of course, COVID made that a little bit harder um, to supervise those transfers. But, um, you know, we working very closely with two labs in Paris, we have been going back to the original films and cleaning up. I mean, a lot of the, the prints came to us um, you know, I said it was the crown jewels, but we're going through outtakes. Um, so a lot of them came to us with grease pencil all over them, with hairs, with dirt. We're going back um, to restore it to its original beauty. Um, and um, that has been a painstaking process. There's been a lot of search for alternate masters. I mean, tragically, the silent world master that the Cousteau Society even had was... Um, quite damaged. Uh, we, we ended up working with BFI to get the best quality master. Um, we're also waiting for it to print from the Academy to see what that, that, that level is. So it's been a real worldwide scavenger hunt to find the absolute best quality uh, images. Um, and in COVID, it's, it's really been a challenge. A lot of those archives closed for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, we have this one place in Paris where everything has to go and be cleaned. Um, so, so it's been, a joy <laughs> and a labor, um, but ultimately, I hope that you know by the time we um, are able to do debut, we have the most gorgeous masters and 4K masters of um, his 35 millimeter uh, cinematography that have ever been shown. So, in the film, like you're very skillfully drawing upon old interviews that <clears throat> Cousteau and other members of the crew have uh, given, and interweaving them with with new ones. Um, I wonder what the your experience was of conducting uh, new interviews. Um, uh, you know, you're talking to people who may have the same kind of feelings of protectiveness over his legacy that you that you described before. Um, what was what was that like getting them, getting people to talk about him who knew him? Yeah, I mean, like like um, the approach I took with Nina Simone, I really wanted the interviewees to be firsthand um, witnesses of his you know, friends, witnesses, et cetera, um, and not talking heads, biographers. I really wanted them to be those those inside folks. And, you know, like, I mean, like with many <laughs> famous, actually every famous person I've ever made a film about, there are camps, right? There are camps, there's a Camp Simone and there's a Camp Jeek and there's a Camp Francine and there are all of these camps. And um, what I think my job is to go in as uh, Switzerland and, um, you know, I'm a storyteller, I'm a conduit and include these various perspectives. So we had a very close friend of his first wife, Simon, right? You know, of course, and we, of course, we talked to um, his surviving children. So, I mean, I think it's about bringing all of those perspectives together um, and certainly relying on the archive and as much of Jeek as we could actually get in the film from uh, interviews he recorded at the time. I wonder, as you were delving into this biography, what were the aspects of his life that you felt a strong connection to? And what were the aspects of his life that you felt kind of challenged to try to understand? You know, he says, um, and it's, it's, a, it's sort of a set piece in the film, it's a turning point. He says, um, an explorer has no right to be a family man. And um, this is before he, um, well, this is before he is public with having had a, an, a, you know, another set of children. And, you know, I think that that remorse that he felt um, about uh, not being present for his two sons and his wife was always there with him. Um, it's both something I cannot relate to because I'm an extremely involved parent, but also it's a pressure 
um, that I do deeply feel as I travel for films and leave my family and pursue my own adventures. So that that personal tension is something that I responded to, both in identifying and not identifying with it. Um, and you know, and I think the quest for new challenges. Like as a filmmaker, I'm always looking for that. I mean, I've I've started doing scripted television and and filmmaking as well as documentary filmmaking. I used to make sort of mostly cinema verite films. I've now, of course, done many, a few, several archival films. Like I'm always looking to put more tools in my toolbox and put myself out on a limb a little bit and feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and that I feel like just keeps me alive and keeps me challenged and keeps me giving it 125%. Um, I never want to get too comfortable. And I think um, I really related to that in him. Of course, his was um, his pursuits were a little more death defying than my own, uh, you know, directing script to television. But uh, <laughs> but indeed, there is that sense of um, you know constantly searching for change. And uh, I want to ask you about the figure of his wife uh, Simone because you really draw that out in uh, the story, even though she was someone who deliberately tried to stay out of uh, the camera. Um, can you talk about you know making her a, a strong presence in this film? I'm so glad you asked that because she, for me, was one of the most exciting discoveries. Um, hearing her perspective about her life on the Calypso, hearing the accounts of how she really ran that boat. Um, um, you know, she was called La Bergère, the shepherdess, for you know keeping the herd from like going over the edge. But of course, it actually had um, more, much more meaning than the literal edge of the boat, right? She was the soul of that boat and the boat was her soul. Um, having come from a family of sailors, um, she says, I have, I have sea water in my veins, not blood. And, but for a woman at the time, of course, she could not become a sailor. So her best choice was to, to marry someone who loved the sea as much as she did. Um, and, you know, you think about what other choices would have been available to her in a time like like now, but um, she was deeply responsible for Cousteau's success and for the success of the Calypso expeditions. She was saucy. She was tough. Um, you know, she was dying of cancer. She didn't tell her husband. She didn't tell her compatriots. She just wanted to keep sailing and she didn't want anyone to tell her to stop. Yeah. Um, as I wrap this up for my last question, I wanna ask about Cousteau, the environmentalist. Um, you described before that he was making warnings decades ago about things that we're very much uh, witnessing and experiencing today in, in the decline of our environment. And I, you know, on the one hand, it uh, feels, um, I don't know, inspiring to, to see that he was uh, prescient about these things. On <clears throat> the other hand, uh, it's depressing in a way that, um, you know, that, you know, the, 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 you know, the most visible explorer of the 20th century had these things to say and, um, and, you know, no one was listening or taking uh, action. I wonder how you've, you know, processed that uh, being so deep in this material. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, it's a Cassandra story, you know, the, the Greek myth of, of the prophet who warns of, you know, impending doom that nobody listens to um, and the tragic, the tragedy of that, um, you know, but, but Cousteau remained forever hopeful. Um, he had some significant accomplishments. He could sort of clock or, or, you know, just, you know, sort of feel secure about with the Antarctic um, before he died. Um, and he had hopes that by inspiring a love for the environment and for the undersea world, that that people would work to protect it. Um, we haven't seen that happen um, on a political level. And um, we are in exactly that crisis um, that he warned about. Um, so it's tragic and it's urgent. Um, and, you know, the ICC report, I think, was, was released two days before we record this. And they talked about, you know, we have we have just the smallest window right now. Um, and um, wouldn't it be wonderful if we started listening? Um, and so, yes, this film is certainly in dialogue with that opportunity. Well, uh, Liz, I thank you for this nuanced portrait and for uh, coming back to Toronto uh, with this film. It's gonna be released later this fall from National Geographic, so uh, viewers can share it with their friends uh, uh, soon. 
Um, but uh, thank you again, Liz, for being here. Thank you, Tom, for having me and the film. <laughs>